Okay, welcome to class, everybody. Happy Friday. Okay, we almost finished chapter 11, kinetics. There's just a few odds and ends I'm gonna say about that. And then we move to chapter 12, electronic properties. And that's the, less, the last really technical chapter we're gonna get to in this class. I don't think we'll have time to get to composites. And so instead we'll talk about sustainability, but that's more conceptual and less um, you know, rigorous calculations. So we're almost there, just about at the end. So I'm just gonna say a few words about chapter 11 before we left off. The main things I hope you'll take away from, uh, from this discussion is that quenching rate and composition can both independently control the properties that you probably care about. You probably care about strength and ductility, and you can, you can control both of those things with either composition or quenching, or you can use both. In general though, if we were going to plot, say, something like tensile strength, hardness, and yield strength, all as a function of carbon content in our steel, what would that look like? So if you're plotting these properties, whether that's tensile strength, hardness, or yield strength, what would those do as a function of the weight percent carbon in your steel? So turn to your neighbor and remind them what it ought to do and what's the reason for that. Okay, what should it do? Adding carbon, moving from a mild steel like 1010 steel, remember the last two numbers represent the point, right? It's the decimal place of how much carbon is there. So 0.1 weight percent carbon would be in 1010 steel. It has 0.10% weight percent carbon. So comparing a 1010 mild steel with something like a 1050 steel, which has five times as much carbon into it, what should that do to our tensile strength, hardness, or yield strength? Yeah. So, if you increase the weight percentage of carbon, okay. Yep. It's actually going to increase all three in general. Yeah, all three of those things are basically, all three of those things are influenced by dislocation motion, right? The total strength is going to be strengthened by dislocations not being able to move. Yield strength, same thing. Hardness is plastic deformation. That's accomplished by dislocation motion. So actually, all three of those things are going to be increased as you move towards higher weight fractions of carbon. Yeah. Other question? OK. Um, uh, and conceptually, the, the way to think of this is as you go from 0 on this graph to increasing carbon, you're going from a very ductile BCC iron at room temperature which is super ductile, it's not particularly strong though, it's just it, you can bend it easy with your fingers. And adding more and more carbon, you're adding a ceramic phase to that. Now, how that phase gets distributed makes a lot of difference. If it's tiny little spheres, right, tiny little precipitates, that looks like tempered martensite. If it's zebra stripes, but they're really fine, that looks like bainite. If they're really coarse ones, that looks like perlite. All three of those would have different strengths, right? Tempered martensite would be the top. Lower would be bainite, lower would be perlite. But in general, adding more of the ceramic phase is going to strengthen it. And what you pay for, on the other hand, is that you lose impact energy and ductility. They're going to have an inverse trend. So the amount of energy that can be absorbed when it fractures, you're going to, it's going to really fall off with more and more carbon, meaning it becomes more brittle. right? Or in other words, the ductility, the maximum ductility or the reduction in area that you can achieve prior to fracture also falls off if you add more of these things. And the same thing with the, uh, with the uh, quenching cycles. You would expect perlite to be the most ductile and tempered martensite to be the least ductile, right? They might have ex different trends. For example, you might have, if the green is tempered martensite, maybe that's your bainite, and this is your perlite, right? The similar sort of trends are gonna exist though, okay? And sure enough, that's kind of what you see. If you look at hardness as a function of weight percent carbon, You've got perlite, all of them increase for one thing, right? But perlite is definitely your softest, 
followed by, in this case, they've got tempered martensite and then martensite. If you were to draw bainite, one would predict bainite to be right there in between, right? So what was the difference between tempered martensite and martensite again? What do we do and what's happening there? Yeah. Yeah, because remember, if you make martensite, you've got that, it had, it had the FCC structure, which got elongated a little bit, it's about a 5% expansion, and that now is a body-centered tetragonal. It doesn't have many active slip systems, it does have cracks in it. It is extremely brittle and extremely hard. It's more like a ceramic than it is like a metal. And so if you don't want that level of brittleness, you temper it, and that recovers, in this case, you lose some hardness, but what they're not showing on this plot is the increase in ductility that you get out of it. And that turns out to be kind of a sweet spot. Tempered martensite is, is a great material for if you want to compromise between the two. Yeah, Alex? Uh, I remember you said that tempered martensite could become kind of smeared. Like like yeah. It looks sort of like we showed its microstructure. So, why is that? Why is it dry? So, okay. Why do you get this tempered martensite structure where it has a bunch of little like specks sort of dispersed everywhere? Why that happens is because technically you're heating it up enough in its phase diagram. Let's look up the steel phase diagram. You're providing a little bit of temperature, which is what it needed, in order for it to, right, you're down here at some composition. When you heat it up, nothing's really changed in terms of the phase diagram. The lever rule hasn't changed that much. So what has changed is diffusion. You've given it the energy it needs for these two phases to separate from one another. Right? At low temperatures, there's an activation energy it has to get over, right? That delta G star to go from one phase to another, it's not enough to overcome it, basically. And so it doesn't. Even though thermodynamics says, oh, where that little finger is on that plot, it should be two-phase mixture, so it should form precipitates. You're at such a low temperature, you can't separate. There's not diffusion enough for this to happen, and you can't overcome that activation energy. But heating it up just a little bit causes these precipitates to form, right? Now, why do precipitates form instead of lamella? That happens because you're at such a low temperature and it's all coming from the solid. Lamellas form when you're starting from a liquid or from one phase to another, it's happening instantaneously. This isn't happening at an instantaneous temperature. This is gonna follow Avrami kinetics instead. Yeah, Alex? So what is the small that Let's see what it would look like. It would not look, I don't think you'd see anything. It's just gonna look like grains, but let's actually look. So instead of tempered, let's just look at regular martensite. It's just gonna look sort of like needles, right? But these are not, what you're seeing here are not alpha and cementite, which you're used to seeing, like the dark and the white contrast. We're used to thinking, oh, one's the carbon rich phase, one's the carbon poor phase. No, I think what you're seeing here is just when you look at different grains under a microscope, you get different uh, contrast due to the orientation of the grains. But these, if it's actually martensite, then you shouldn't have more than one phase. These should all be the same phase, and the colors just represent different orientations. I don't know if that's what we actually see here, but that's you know what we Googled. Okay, other questions about this? Okay. Um, we also mentioned last time there was a really great question that, you know, when you quench these things, how do you know like there's this big block of material? Is it all gonna be the same thing, like, like a nice homogeneous temperature? No, no way. Your, your different parts of your material are going to quench at different rates because they can store different amounts of heat depending on how deep in your material they are, how much thermal mass is around it. All these things are going to change it. And you'll see this, like when blacksmiths make swords and stuff, there's all these different sort of colors, right? These colors are not due to the metal. It's actually the oxide on the surface, right? So we know that metals oxidize in the presence of oxygen. And so what you're seeing there is different things thicknesses of the oxide coat. So up above it, they've got the tempering colors of steel. And if you've got fully quenched, you're over there. And then if you sort of temper it after quenching it at those different temperatures, you see the colors changing. What's happening there is not anything quantum mechanical in the metal itself. It's just the oxide thickness layer. It turns out light will bounce off at different colors based off of how thick that oxide layer is. And if you go to higher and higher temperatures, you're going to get a thicker oxide layer lower temperatures, it's going to be thinner. And so you can get all these interesting colors out of, and you see this when you weld, right? When you make a weld, it has that sort of rainbow splash color around it. That's because there's different heat zones from the weld. And so that, that's actually what you're seeing is the oxide, not the metal itself changing colors, OK? Um, something else wor worth noting in this chapter is precipitation hardening. Uh, 
Tempered martensite would technically be a type of precipitation hardening, right? You form those little tiny precipitates of the iron carbide phase in an otherwise matrix of BCC iron, and that really gives you a, a lot of strengthening. This is really important in other materials like aluminum. They will add things to aluminum like copper or lithium. Copper is one of the like, common ones. Like, for example, aluminum, I think it's AL319. That's the aluminum grade that they use for airplane skins. Um, a hundred years ago, the Wright brothers actually made the first aluminum copper alloy when they made their engine for the first airplane. I don't know if you believe that America invented the first airplane, and there's debate. Um, but they added about 8% copper, right? Between 6 and 8% of copper, copper to this thing. And what they were aiming for, not intentionally, they had no idea what they were doing. But what they were getting is that, as you go down right here, in this region right there, what do you have? Where that little arrow point is pointing, what do I have there? I have a single phase, right? They're calling it the kappa phase, looks like. Okay, because you got the little K there. So you have a single phase, and it is close to the maximum amount of copper that you can stuff into an aluminum lattice at that temperature at around you know, 500 or so degrees. That's the most copper that you can stick into that lattice and have it be a single phase. But think what's going to happen as you cool that thing down. As you cool it down, and if you quench it, then it's just going to be exactly what you had before. You're going to have a metastable phase. But if you cool it down somewhat slowly, then that copper, you're now going to precipitate out. You've got kappa plus phi or epsilon, whatever they, whatever they have written there. It's the copper-rich phase, right? That's going to precipitate out. And you can, see, you can see these precipitates form as you go from kappa to now a little bit of copper to even like this nice fine dispersion of copper. And what that does is it strengthens it. The reason that the Wright brothers did this is it made their engine, the metal actually flow better. It changed the viscosity of the metal. It flowed so they could cast their engine. So they had no idea they were going to get strengthening. They got strengthening. That turned out to be an awesome thing because aluminum is really lightweight as it is. And if you strengthen it, you can even do thinner components. So this turned out to be the first aviation you know, alloy. And they didn't really know why they got it. They just lucked out, if you will, right? Nowadays, we can do a whole lot better. Aluminum 319, the stuff that makes up the skin of all modern airplanes that aren't like hobby crafts made of composite and stuff, the vast majority are still made of aluminum. They're skins for now. Um, and it has 10 different elements, right? It's got this smorgasbord of different elements in it, not just aluminum and copper. And they're accurate to uh, not a tenth of a percent, but a, a hundredth of a percent, right? So that's four sig figs of accuracy over 10 different elements, right? Think of what the, the engineering had to go into to create that. There's literally billions and billions of combinations, if you, if you did this mathematically speaking, 10 different elements, each of them at one one thousandth accuracy. That's, that's infinite possibilities of alloys. So how on earth did they go from the Wright Brothers aluminum to the aluminum that we use today is like a big question in material science. How do we discover new materials faster when there are billions, infinite possibilities of different alloys out there? And it might be just one that has the properties that are really best for what, for what you need to use, right? This is an open question right now. It relies on concepts like integrated computational material science, where folks in mechanical engineering, material science, chemistry all sort of come together and develop tools that can systematically explore compositional or microstructural space for better alloys. Um, in any case, these things are used because of the precipitates that form, right? Now, why do you get this strengthening from precipitates? Um, you get strengthening, well, somebody tell me, why do you get strengthening from precipitates? Dislocations can't move. For one thing, like if this is the precipitate in an otherwise lattice of aluminum, the dislocation, when it impinges on this, it either has to go around it or cross the grain boundary, and maybe it's at a different orientation. So that's all going to slow down dislocations. But that's not the main strengthening mechanism. Actually, the main strengthening mechanism has to do with the strain at the interface. So let's take a look at this. If you look at this thing, so at high temperatures, you'd have this picture on the left where your solvent and your solute atoms are shown. You've got the solvent is aluminum, the solute is copper, right? And at those high temperatures, it's all dissolved, meaning those coppers are just randomly placed everywhere. There's no, there's no ordering, right? But if you cool it down and you cross over that thermodynamic boundary, all of a sudden, you start to form what they're calling that, that theta phase, right? The theta double prime phase. And that's just a mixture of copper and aluminum at some specific ratio. I don't know what it is, but it's some ratio. Two to one, one to three, whatever it is, right? That's going to form as a little precipitate. And look what happens. If, there's, if this precipitate's not too large, 
look at the regions along the boundary of that thing. They still sort of match up with the host matrix. You see that? They're kind of stretched, but they sort of match up. We call that a coherent boundary, a coherent phase boundary. If it's a perfectly or an epitaxial coherent phase boundary, then it matches up perfectly. Or in other words, let's imagine that I'm taking, I'm going to put a new row of students here. If I lined up the, the chairs exactly in front of the previous chairs, that would be an epitaxial layer. I lined it up perfectly. That's going to minimize strain. But that might not be what happens, because your phase, that theta phase, it might have a different lattice parameter than the material around it. So those chairs, if I was putting chairs, they might be closer together or further apart. Like what if I was putting like lazy boys here, right? They're not going to match up anymore, right? So that would be an incoherent phase boundary. So you see that over here. For example, in the one on the right, you see that they've elongated that, that vertical axis. So now they no longer match up, and they don't even try to. It's such a big degree of mismatch that it stops trying to match it, right? The sweet spot for precipitation hardening is between these two things. If you're between these two things, you get the strain from it trying to match it with as much surface area as you can have that strain acting on. If you grow them too large, then it just says, oh, forget it. I'm just going to form an incoherent phase boundary. And that relieves all of the strain in the surrounding lattice, right? Right now, if I lined up chairs here, these students are going to try and line up with the chair right in front of them if you're atoms, right? Because you're going to try and bond to them. But if it's too complicated, if I'm putting big old lazy boys and it doesn't match up, you're just going to say, oh, forget it. I'm not going to bother. And then all the strain that had been induced in your host is relieved. If the strain is relieved here, dislocations can just go whizzing by, right? If the strain is present, then the dislocations can't move through it, and you strengthen your material. So there's this phenomenon called aging and overaging when it comes to precipitation hardening. Typically. When you do precipitation hardening, you'll see the following trend happen. As you, OK, so here they're showing the hardness of an alloy, but that could also be the yield strength or most of these other strength properties. If you plot it as a function of time held in the tempering region where you're going to cause the precipitates to grow, you'll initially see a rise. In this case, there's two peaks because there's, we're not going to say why. Just imagine that it goes up and then it goes down. That's more general. It's rising because you're increasing both the strain and the amount of surface area that has that strain. But if you go too far, the grains get too big, then they just say, we're going to form an incoherent phase boundary instead of the semi-coherent one. And then you lose all your strengthening. So you can overdo it, is the point. So not only think about what this means for aluminum alloys. You not only have to have 10 different alloys. That's a tenth of the useful periodic table. It has to be four significant figures accurate. And you have to have just the right tempering to get it in that sweet spot. So there is a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton of metallurgy, mechanical engineering, material science going into improved mechanical alloys. Yeah, Emma? How could they temper that much material? Uh, so it would depend on your application. If it's airplane skins, these things are thin. Um, then you're going to get a relatively homogeneous cross section. Um, if you're doing other things, like a really big, thick component, think what would happen if you put that in a furnace. Right? What does fixed second law teach us is that heat's going to diffuse into your material, and it's going to depend on the diffusivity of material, how, what that temperature gradient looks like. But there will be a gradient in your sample, right? at least initially, until it reaches equilibrium. So that's a problem. That means that the stuff on the outside is maybe getting overaged by the time the stuff in the middle is getting just right aged. Do you see the problem here? So to fix that, they've come up with all sorts of clever other ways of annealing materials. You can do. Um, induced electric current, right? So you can use a magnetic field. If you have a metal and you induce an electric current in it with a magnet, then the whole thing basically heats up. So this is called an induction furnace. You can essentially make your whole material heat up relatively uniformly in an induction furnace. So there's all sorts of clever ways that people have come up with to anneal things uniformly. But it depends on sort of the dimensions of your sample. Alex? Uh, if you overage it, it will become ductile, right? Because think what's happening. If you overage it, all of these, see these boundaries are no longer matching up anymore? If they're not matching up anymore, then the, the strain that used to be in this lattice because of the mismatch is relieved. If that strain's not there, a dislocation can just sail right by. So it, it became more ductile. It became ductile. Uh, it's no longer as hard, though, is the downside. Okay?
Other questions I can answer about this? Okay. Um, there's also, you know, we've been talking a lot about metals and ceramics because that's my jam, but polymers also, their uh, kinetics are also important. The things to realize there that stand out are the transformations that they go through. For example, the glassy transition temperature. We've mentioned glassy transition temperature a few times in this class so far. As you go from this glassy ceramic-like state at low temperatures and you heat it up, it will eventually transition through this rubbery state and eventually become a liquid that flows. And this doesn't happen at like a single sharp temperature, right? In fact, you can see it like sort of bending. It's like a knee in the curve. So the way to determine the glassy transition temperature is to take a linear fit of this region down here, a linear fit of this region down here, and to see where those two lines sort of intersect. And it's typically that it happens over a range of temperatures. Glassy transition onset might be 20, 30, 40 degrees, depending on your polymer system, okay? But this is another example of a phase transformation. And just like everything else, you can quench through this, right? You can quench through that, okay? Um, Crystallization would look the same as opposed to gl going glassy. Polymers crystallize. We showed you an example of that with the Avrami kinetics. Okay, um, any other questions about chapter 11 before we move on? Okay, let's keep going to chapter 12 then. Chapter 12 is really cool. It is on electronic properties. It might be the one that I think everyone in the room maybe knows the least about. Most of the other stuff is a little more intuitive. Electronic properties are a little bit less intuitive, I think. There's a little more physics that we have to get into. So here's our learning objectives. We're going to describe electrical conductivity as if it were a flux, because we've talked about fluxes before. And a flux mean, simply means that it has a driving force and a constant in proportionality. Just like mass transport or heat transport, electrical transport can be described with the same mathematics, right? We're gonna differentiate between the total resistance, which is the resistance value that you read off of a box when you buy resistors, and the material property, which is electrical resistivity, right? That's a fundamental material property. It doesn't depend on the geometry of your sample. So we'll talk about the difference there. We'll use geometry to switch between the two. Um, we're gonna calculate the heat that's generated as a current passes through a material. If we have time at the end of class today, we're gonna introduce band diagrams and talk about what on earth is a band diagram and where does it come from. That's probably as far as we'll get. Okay. So I'd say some of the most exciting advances in material science have come from understanding electrical transport materials. Just last night, well two nights ago, on the night of the 13th, a paper was reported in Nature saying that a thermoelectric device with a ZT of six has been developed. Now I'm super duper skeptical. What does that mean though? Thermoelectric ZT over time. What comes up? If I, do we get an image here? ZT, I'll show you. Here's a plot that shows um, power generation efficiency. So converting waste heat into electricity. This is the efficiency at which you can do that. It's gonna depend on the heat source. Here's, if you guys have taken thermal, you've got the Carnot limit, right? Basically as good as you can do, unless you're gonna violate the first law of thermodynamics, which we don't do, right? You can't do better than that black line, which tells you the hotter your engine runs, the more efficient it is. That's one takeaway. But what you see here is a bunch of dashed lines and dotted lines and things like that, and it has a, a ZT next to it, right? So ZT is, it's a material, it, you derive it from materials properties for thermoelectric materials, and the higher ZT gets, as it approaches infinity, you get Carnot efficiency. And the very best materials out there, and they're a little bit kind of, if you believe them too, are at two. So we don't have like amazingly efficient thermoelectric devices. But thermoelectric devices are amazing because there's no moving parts and they're tiny and you can put them anywhere, right? You don't have to have a power plant. You can, put it, you can put it on your watch band and they do this today, right? You can buy headlamps and stuff that are powered by these things. And a material two nights ago was reported to have a ZT of six, which is, if it's true, gonna be a Nobel Prize, right? And that is because of electronic properties. They found a clever way to engineer the properties. Now I'm still super duper skeptical. I'll post the article on Canvas. Um, it was published in Nature for what it's worth. Uh, we'll see about it. Yeah, Abby? Uh, so this doesn't store energy, this converts energy. Energy can be stored electrochemically, like in a battery, right? It can be stored electrically, like in a capacitor. It can be stored thermally, like in a phase change material, like you store it in the latent heat as it transforms from one phase to another, it, it absorbed energy. But this isn't storage of energy, this is conversion from waste heat, which is like a form of energy, to 
an electrical voltage which could power a smartphone or charge a battery. It could, you could turn it into electrical or electrochemical energy. All right, in order to do all of that interesting stuff, you know, and I've got some cool demos on that I'll bring up for next class, you're, we have to have a basic understanding of electronic properties, right? So let's start with electronic conduction. We've already seen that fluxes exist. We saw flux of heat and mass, right? Mass, we called it fixed first law. For heat, we called it Fourier's law, but it's really just fixed first law applied to heat. And in both those cases, look what you have. You have a flux, J, and the amount of flux of whether that's mass or heat, it's proportional to a driving force. In one case, it's dc dx. In temperature, it's dt dx. So it's the gradient of either composition or temperature. And then in both of those cases, it has a constant of proportionality. In mass, we call that the diffusion coefficient. In heat, we call that the thermal conductivity. But it's just a constant. It tells you the proportionality. The same exact thing exists for electrical transport. This time, what's our driving force? So the current is not current of mass or current of heat. It's going to be current of electrons, of electrical carriers, right? Something that carries charge, OK? So our J, our flux, is the amount of current, right, per area per time. That's the flux, OK? And then the driving force, this time, it's not the concentration difference, the temperature difference. It's the d phi dx, where phi is the electric potential. So if you have a difference in the electric potential, like you have a 9-volt battery, which has two electrodes, right? One's at positive 9 volts, one's at 0. When you hook your device up to that, it causes electrons to shuttle through it, because on one end, it's got 9 volts. The other one's got 0 volts, and there's some distance between it, right? So there's a difference in potential. That's d phi. Right? D phi. And then dx is just the difference. We have a word for that. We call that the electric field. The electric field is the gradient in the potential, right? So uh, you get electrical conductivity in response to an electric field. J, our flux of current of something like electrons, is going to be equal to sigma. That is not strength sigma. We ran out of variables. When you study all the things, you run out of variables. So now sigma means electrical conductivity, right? The amount of current that you get is proportional to the electric field. And the constant of proportionality is the electrical conductivity. Any questions so far? OK. So this just looks like fixed first law, right? Ohm's law, we call this, is just fixed first law. But instead of being applied to mass or heat, it's applied to electrical carriers. Right now, the simplest thing that can carry electricity is electrons. So we're going to talk about those for now. We'll talk about other things later, OK? Um, so the, the Ohm's law that you're familiar with looks like V equals IR. That's the Ohm's law that you saw in high school physics. That's not exactly the same here, because look at what you're showing here. First off, it needs to be rearranged. It needs to be I equals V over R, because I is the current. That's the thing that's analogous to flux, right? And then they've got V. Just, they're calling that the voltage, but that technically is the difference in voltage. And then you divide that by R, which is your resistance. So right away, you see that the electric field is clearly related to the voltage, right? But R is our total resistance. And up here, it's conductivity. Conductivity has units of Siemens per meter. Sometimes they write that as inverse meters per meter or Mohs per meter, which is just ohm spelled backwards. I don't know who came up with that, but it's a thing. It's a thing. OK? All right, I didn't come up with it. So resistance, the value that you read off a box in your double E class, that's big R. That's resistance. But that's not a fundamental material property. Because if you put five or six resistors together, you've changed the overall resistance. But that doesn't mean that the resistivity, the innate material property that made it resist electrons in the first place, that it changed in your materials. They could all be the exact same in all five resistors. It's just that by adding them together, you increase the overall resistance. So these are two fundamentally different things. The resistivity is a material property that doesn't depend on geometry. The resistance is it uses the material property resistivity, but it also takes into account geometry. Here's how it does it. Okay? So resistivity is not the same as resistance. And conductivity, which we used in our flux equation up here, sigma up here, that's just the inverse of material resistivity, right? The electrical resistivity, if you take the one over that, you get the electrical conductivity. 
not how much it resists it, it's how much it conducts it, okay? So electrical conductivity is one over rho. Now, how does this relate to geometry? This is made of some material. Let's call it, I mean, whatever. It's a metal, it's, it's whatever you want it to be, right? It has some inherent material resistivity. This material has a resistivity, which we'll write rho, right? But the overall resistance of that resistor, capital R, capital R is going to be equal to, obviously, the more resistive your material is, then your resistance will increase. So they're going to be proportional. But it's also going to depend on how long this is, because the current has to travel through that thing. So if it's longer, you're going to build up more resistance. right? So we're going to put length over there, the length of your resistor. And if this is wider, if, it's, if it has a larger cross-sectional area, that's not going to help it resist electrical current. That's going to work against you. So you divide this by the cross-sectional area. This is exactly analogous to water in a pipe. If you were to quantify the resistance of water traveling through a pipe, it would depend on the inherent, like the viscosity of the water. That would be like the resistivity, right? The water is going to have some resistance to motion. That's like your resistivity. The length of that pipe, if you go and you try and pump water through a longer and longer pipe, you're going to have to use a bigger and bigger pressure, right, to drive it, right? That's like the, the resistance increasing. But if you use a larger diameter pipe, it gets easier. So this is the exact same idea. Water in a pipe is exactly like electrons traveling through your material, OK? As you move electricity through your material, what happens? It heats up. We saw that earlier this semester when we melted part of the table with the iron wire, right? I passed a current through it. And in that case, I was using an AC current. I was switching the polarity, positive, negative. It was switching from side to side really quickly. But the same thing happens with DC current, right? It'll still heat up either way. And how much does it heat up? We can estimate it with this expression here. The joule heating that you can expect to see, we call it joule heating, anytime you heat up metal by passing a current through it. It's going to be equal to, well, it's going to be proportional to. That's what the little funky symbol means. The little kind of looks like an alpha. That means proportional to the current squared. The current is, right, it's quantifying how much electrical, uh, how much electrons are moving in it, multiplied by the total resistance times time. So you can literally calculate a heat that should be generated if you know the resistance of your material, the current that you pass through it, and how long you do this for, OK? So what, in the early days when I did that iron wire demo, I kept on tripping breakers in every room that I did it in. And what I was doing wrong is that I went to the store and I bought just the, the first iron wire that I could find. But I was buying really thick gauge iron wire. So think what's happening. You've got different gauge wires from the really thin stuff, which I nowadays use, and then really thick stuff, which you can buy as well. In those early days, I was using really thick gauge wire. So what do you think my resistance was, big or small? I had a small resistance. So now apply Ohm's law to this. The wall outlet has 120 volts, right? It's going to produce some current through your material depending on the resistance. If you have a small resistance, do you produce a big or a small current? A big current. What do circuit breakers prevent you from doing? having a big current, because, they, because you get exactly what I was trying to do. I was trying to generate a bunch of heat right? by having a big current. Current squared gives you more heat. But I went over 20 amps, and I tripped the breaker. right? So to prevent that, but to actually make the demo work, what I had to do, I'm not going to be able to change the voltage from the wall. So if I don't want the current, breaker, the current to trip the breaker by hitting 20 amps, I have to increase my resistance. You can do that by either making a longer experiment, which you can, we've done that, right? If you do this thing longer, it will not trip the breaker, or just move to a thinner gauge wire, right? Which is cheaper anyways, and that'll also reduce the current so it doesn't trip the breaker, okay? That is joule heating, though, okay? Uh, let's do a quick example of this. So the question is, how much heat would be generated if you passed 15 amps, which is right around where most homes, most homes, if you look at your electrical box, your circuit breaker, literally when you trip a breaker, you're just giving it too much current, and there's a little switch that prevents your house from burning down. Most of those, it happens at between 15 and 20, depending on which ones you bought. You might have a heavy-duty welder or something, and maybe you bought a 40-amp breaker or something. But let's assume that you're doing 15 amps, the maximum that most house will let you do, house power will let you do. You pass it through a long rectangular sample of copper. The dimensions of that sample are 3 by 4, by 10 millimeters, or in other words, if this is your sample, 
it's 3 by 4 by 10. We're passing current through it like that, okay? You pass that current through it for one minute. Assume that copper has a constant electrical resistivity, meaning it doesn't change its ability to conduct electrons as you heat it up. That's not a fair assumption, by the way. Things do change. We're going to use that for this problem, though. We're going to assume the conductivity, the resistivity doesn't change, and it's given as 16.78 nano ohms times meters. I want you to give me the answer in millijoules rounded to the nearest millijoule. And remember that one ohm is equal to a joule per second amp squared. So again, the question is asking how much heat gets generated. So if you're feeling stuck, we're going to go back to our joule heating equation, which says that Q is proportional. Since we don't know any better, we're going to assume that means equal right now to the current squared, I squared, times R multiplied by T. And we also just taught you that you need, if you don't know the total resistance, but you do have the geometry and the resistivity, that the total resistance is equal to the resistivity times the length divided by the cross-sectional area. I suggest putting everything in, ohm, in ohms and meters, but you can do what you want. OK, another minute or two, get your answers in. Okay, another 30 seconds, get an answer in. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. Okay, so most people are getting that correct. About 70% of people are getting it right. The thing to watch for here is going to be units for sure. That's what's going to throw people off.
Again, I think it's smartest to take, like we gave the question, it was in millimeters and nano ohms per meter, right? Convert all that to regular SI units. Go from millimeters to meters, right? And then go from nano ohms to ohms by just making it times 10 to the negative 9. That way, these numbers are in amps. When you plug in your units to this expression, you're going to get some number, but it's going to be equal to, in fact, what is the number? I get 100 and, so 0 0.188, 0 0.1887, or whatever, right? That's going to have the units of amps squared times ohms per second. And then you just take this relationship here for ohms and you plug it in joules, right? So that means that this is the same as joules per second amp squared multiplied by amp squared per second. Wait, am I missing something? Am I missing something? Oh, I'm multiplying time, sorry. Times time. So then you get uh, these things cancel out, and you just get joules. Your answer right now is in joules. So to, to get this right, all you have to do is multiply that by 1,000, because we want millijoules. So I get 188. I guess round it up to be 189 millijoules. OK? Any questions? Can answer any questions about this? OK, pretty straightforward. This is joule heating. When they designed stoves, the old like curly stoves that your grandma might have had, that's just joule heating, right? They know how much current your power, your house, you know, the, the electrical system in your house can put out, basically 15 amps. And so they designed a material to get the biggest amount of heating as possible. That's why this thing wraps around itself, because you're trying to increase the length, right? By increasing the length, you increase the resistance, right? You're increasing R without causing this thing to trip a breaker, right? So if you're stuck at 15 amps or whatever your, current, your stove is designed for, you can get more heating by just having longer, right? A longer portion of it. So these things curl around themselves and that whole thing heats up, OK? Um, how about this one? If the copper from the previous experiment was initially at 25 degrees Celsius, what would be the final temperature if copper has a specific heat of 3,860 joules per kilogram K and a density of 8.933 grams per centimeter cubed. Give the answer in degrees, rounding to the nearest hundredth of a degree. The thing to catch on this one, we just calculated heat, right? So we need to go from heat to temperature final. The way that we're going to do that is with the specific heat equation, which tells us that Q equals, uh, sorry, the specific heat equals the amount of heat that goes into something per mass per uh, change in temperature, delta T, let's call that. OK? So knowing that our heat is 189 millijoules, go ahead and give that problem a, an attempt. Remember, the dimensions of this were 4 by 3 by 10, and those were in millimeters. <laughs> 
Okay, another minute or two to wrap this one up. Okay, I'm going to wrap, the, wrap up the poll. Oh, <laughs> got to say something. <laughs> All right, now it's open. It's a bar? <laughs> they bar you from making errors? OK, I'm going to close the poll. Everybody got your answers in? Type something in. OK, closing the poll. And people think what? Yeah. About 60% of the people. Oh, so some people submitted, like, that's the correct answer, but you need to add that to your, like, you solved for delta T, but you need to add that to your original temperature. So you, you started at 25 degrees Celsius. When I plug everything in, I find that I get a value for delta T of 0 0.045. If you got something else, it's likely a unit problem. So you're going to add 25 plus 0 0.045 degrees Celsius, right? Now, maybe you converted it to Kelvin. But remember, we're taking a difference in temperature, and the difference in Celsius is the same as the difference in Kelvin, because they're on the same scale. They just shifted from one another. In any case, the point here is that this stuff that's in your home, if this was the wire that your home was made out of, you don't need to worry about your home burning down, because this didn't heat up very much. Is there a question? Did I mess something up? 25. Oh, I probably messed that up. Oh, that's a huge range. Oh, it's just a giant range. I, I think I program it in to do like 10% or 5% of the range automatically. I think that's what that is. But yeah, the, the delta T is like not even a tenth of a degree. You're at half of a tenth of a degree. So this is not heating up very much. Um, we use copper in our homes because it has such great electrical conductivity. right? If we go back up here to our resistance equation, this resistivity. That's 1 divided by the conductivity. If we used a material that wasn't such a great conductor, then our resistance would be larger. If the resistance is larger, then the heat that gets generated is larger. So in the olden days, like not even that long ago, like your grandparents' homes might have had aluminum wires in them. They made aluminum wires for a while. Um, but these are more resistive, among other problems. And that caused them to heat up more and actually became a, a fire safety issue. So now code requires that you use copper wires. <laughs>
if you're going to have these large currents running through them. Okay, we'll pick up next time.